Welcome to or welcome back to the 510 Report. This is a special edition of the 510 Report. I wanted to revisit something from last week's 510 Report. So last week we mentioned that Scott Gottlieb had talked about restricting and limiting flavored vapor products to brick and mortar vapor shop locations. Essentially pulling them off of convenience store shelves and regulating them to brick and mortar shops where he thinks that the carding of underage people might be taken, I don't know, a little bit more seriously. Scott Godlib had also mentioned the possibility of an online ban for flavored vapor products. Real quickly, I felt the need to sort of reiterate my stance on this. I'm not sure if I misspoke or if people just misinterpreted what I was saying, but no, obviously I do not not not, not, not support an online ban. That would be ridiculous. I don't support a ban of any kind. This is definitely a case of if you give the government an inch, they will take a mile. And with that said, I am still okay with Scott Gottlieb regulating and limiting flavored vapor products to brick and mortar stores. This isn't something that's completely unheard of. There are alcohol stores where you go and you buy alcohol and they card you when you come in. There are marijuana dispensaries where you go and buy marijuana and they card you before you go in. I don't see why vape shops can't sell vapor products where you get carded before you go in. This overall makes a lot of sense to me. Keeping in mind that this is literally just for flavored vapor products, not anything that is a tobacco or a menthol type of vape, right? So you would probably still be able to go into an AM PM or a 7-Eleven or a Flying J or a Circle K and get a tobacco or menthol flavored jewel product or other vapor product. One of the things that I was thinking about in my head is if we limit flavored vapor products to strictly vape shops and we pull them out of convenience stores, is that doing a great disservice to smokers? I think if tobacco and menthol vapor products are still allowed in convenience stores, then no, not really. I don't think we're doing a great disservice to smokers. I genuinely think organizations like the Truth Initiative, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, and the FDA are doing a bigger disservice to smokers by trying to tell them that vaping is just as bad as smoking is for them. So no, of course I do not, not, not support an online ban in any capacity. What I was asking for in that particular video was feedback. I was just putting the idea out there. How do you feel about an online ban? How would an online ban affect you? How would flavored vapor products being regulated strictly to vape shops affect you? And I got a lot of comments back. And I just wanted to take a little bit of time and read through some of these comments and maybe give my opinion on a few of them. Thank you to everybody that commented on that video and your comments are always welcome on any video, except the ones I have the comments turned off for. Those are turned off for a reason. Anyway, the first one here comes from Kurt. It's ridiculous to expect all adults to have to go to a brick and mortar store for flavored e-juice. The cost will go up dramatically just because of rent and the lack of competition. I do not visit vape shops because a few years ago, I noticed everything being sold at retail vape shops was way overpriced compared to online shops. Yes, you can pay a lot online also, but after some quick online shopping, you can really get good prices as well. The government is using kids as the excuse, but the real agenda is controlling how adults choose to spend their money and what they put in their body. It really pisses me off that this conversation even needs to be had. I absolutely agree with you, Kurt. Here's the thing. Yes, it generally is cheaper to find things online to purchase. That's not just with vapor products. That's kind of with everything. The problem is the government doesn't care about your wallet. Making the argument that things need to be available online because the price is cheaper is not not a very strong argument to stand on. The government doesn't care how much something costs you to buy because you're buying it of your own free will. So the cost argument, while I agree with you, Kurt, it isn't gonna make a big difference to the federal government. Got a comment here from Matthew. I disagree. Without convenience store sales, that customer who would have had a chance to switch most likely won't. Let's say a man goes into a gas station to purchase his cigarettes. While he's there waiting in line to buy his pack for the day, he gets an epiphany and wants to try quitting. It happened to me. 
me and buys a jewel. You're forcing those who are on the fence of quitting to go out of their way to purchase a device. Most people are all about convenience. Most smokers still smoke because it's convenient for them to just light up and not have to go to a vape shop, which could be miles away. This ties into online sales as well. Those who live in rural areas may not have a shop within a hundred miles or so. Think about that, Nick. It would force those that don't live by vape shops to continue to smoke. The forcing those that don't live near a vape shop to continue to smoke is a very compelling argument. Got a comment here from one vape at a time. In the area I live, I would have to drive nearly two hours to find a decent brick and mortar shop. I've tried. I feel like limiting flavored products to vape shops would be a temporary solution. I think the reason miners are able to purchase things like the jewel at gas stations, etc., is laziness. If vape shops are the only ones carrying such products, underage vapors will still find a way to get the product if they really want it. Gas stations are supposed to card anyone who appears to be under 40 years old and just don't. What guarantee is there that these vape shops will obey the regulation? The parents need to police their kids, not the FDA. Mr. One Vape at a Time, I absolutely agree with you as well. I do think it is the parents' job to police their kids, not the FDA. Got another comment here from Pierce. I apologize for the length of this in advance. I agree with the brick and mortars being treated as a bar and have to show your ID to enter. I also see how that would ward away newcomers to vaping, but I see that as a way to protect the community that we have grown and come to love. As for getting rid of online transactions altogether, I believe would hurt everybody in the community as well. I myself am about an hour away from the nearest brick and mortar, so online is the best choice for me, even if I have to verify every purchase. Don't get me wrong, I always go out of my way for them, but online bulk is usually what my income prefers. Bill left a comment and said, my vape life is 100% from online. I think they need to set in place stronger methods of aid verifications for online sales, not ban it. Bill, I, I could not agree with you more. I see no reason why in 2018 with the technology we have that we can't verify someone's age through a website. How does that software not really exist yet? There are things out there like blue check, which is generally kind of just a pain in the ass. There's got to be a better way, and I don't know why someone hasn't done it yet. Vapester Deluxe left a comment. I make my own e-liquid, which is 10 times cheaper than buying it pre-made, and that requires me to buy my flavorings and DIY supplies online. This way I can quickly mix up a 30 ml bottle of tasty e-juice for less than a dollar compared to the $20 I would pay at my local vape shop for the same amount, not to mention the lack of variety in vaping hardware at my local vape shops. I think vape sales should be limited to physical and online vape shops. This honestly raises another pretty good question. What constitutes a flavored vapor product? I get the feeling that DIY supplies might not be affected by an online ban if that online ban is for flavored vapor products. Buying a gallon of PG is not a flavored vapor product. Buying a 100 ml bottle of high nicotine for DIY mixing isn't a flavored vapor product. And buying flavorings from the Perfumer's Apprentice or Loran's is not a flavored vapor product. So Vapester Deluxe, I think your DIY supplies will be safe if, again, the ban is just for flavored vapor products. And I just want to mention again, flavored nicotine is what I believe the FDA is really concerned with. I don't think they're concerned about a battery. I don't even think they're concerned with open vapor systems. I think what the FDA is really focused on and really going after are pre-filled high nicotine, salt nicotine pods. Pre-filled pods. I screen captured about 87 different comments, so I'm going to try to get through as many of them as I can. Scott left a comment. I have at least half a dozen vape shops within a 20 minute drive from my house. I purchased 90% of my vape juice and gear online because of the money savings. I vape a lot and could not afford it if the FDA banned online sales. Again, Scott, I absolutely agree with you. Online sales are generally less expensive than brick and mortar shops, but also the FDA, they don't care if it's more expensive for you. The money savings argument is, in my opinion, a very legitimate argument, just not to the FDA. Got a comment here from Hamilton. Sounds like a decent middle ground for the gas station restrictions, but banning flavors from online sales sounds like it will harm the e-juice industry. I have several vape shops in my city, but they are none in my neighborhood. So just picking up a bottle of juice would require a lot of time out of my day. If we're not trusting the internet for age verification on adult transactions, then I think we have some other industries that we can focus on as well. Very, very well said, Hamilton. You can still buy tobacco cigarettes online as well as 
hard alcohol and beer online. Got a comment from Bayhawk? Yeah, I order a ton of my e-juice online. Just find better deals and prices. My shop down the street sells 120 mil for $32. Element vape, 18 to $25. Adds up when wanting to buy multiple bottles or try new lines for a buy it to try it price. Again, federal government, doesn't care about price. Got another comment here from Eden. I mix all my own liquids and order my supplies from Nicotine River, saving me hundreds of dollars a year. If an online ban effectively shut down websites like that, people like me would be mildly screwed to say the least. And going back to something I said earlier, I don't think that DIY supplies would fall under this online ban. And honestly, Eden, thank you for pointing me towards Nicotine River. I had never heard of that website before, and it is pretty fantastic for DIY supplies. No affiliation, not endorsing it, but you should definitely check out that website if you're interested in DIY. And lastly on this topic, I got Salt City Vapor. I would agree with Scott on this one if he doesn't ban online sales for flavored vapor products. Online sales are huge for me and a bunch of people I know. I personally think no vapor products should be sold anywhere but a vape shop and online. If that's the extent of regulation and we can still have flavors, I'm totally okay with that. I'm generally very, very torn on this particular subject. I don't like giving up freedoms to the federal government. Things like online bans would be detrimental to vaping. I don't like saying to the federal government, it's okay if you ban flavors from convenience stores. And I said this earlier, but if you give the federal government an inch, they will take a mile. If we say to the federal government, Yes, I agree with you. Let's pull all flavored vapor products from convenience stores and relegate them strictly to vape shops. I still don't know if that would be a good thing. I know I said previously in the 510 report that I agreed with Scott Gottlieb that sure, we can still have flavors in vape shops. And unfortunately, if it comes down to having no flavors at all or having flavors but in vape shops, of course I'm gonna choose having flavors but in vape shops. I want vaping to succeed. I want vaping to be here, not just for us vapors, not just for the community, but for smokers out there. The whole reason that we're doing any of this, the whole reason that any tobacco harm reduction advocate is fighting for tobacco harm reduction isn't necessarily for the community of vapors, but for the 480,000 people that are going to die this year from tobacco related illnesses. We need to give them the same chance that we got to quit smoking. And I think if that means a smoker having to take one more step to get to a vapor product, I feel like that's not a completely unreasonable thing to ask of somebody. If they can still pick up a tobacco or menthol flavored jewel at a convenience store, and that's enough to get them interested in vaping, and that's enough to keep them off of their cigarettes, then mission accomplished. If they then decide after that, maybe I'd like to try a blueberry or mango flavor, then they can go to a vape shop and get their flavored vapor products. We do have to remember that this industry is kind of still in its infancy. So when I hear from subscribers where they say, I have to drive two hours to get to a vape shop, I have to drive three hours to get to a vape shop, the longer time that goes on and the more popular that vaping gets and the more people that continue to move from traditional tobacco cigarettes into far less harmful vapor products, there will be more brick and mortars. Capitalism will expand the reach of vapor products. So yeah, I think that's where we're gonna leave that. And I would like to end this 510 report with one last comment from Stomp and Peak. It's not related to the subject of online sales and it's not related to the relegating of flavored vapor products to brick and mortar shops. I just really like it and I wanna read it. While I was a lifelong heroin user, it is possible to smoke it without a vape. Very easy example foil, straw, and a lighter. I'm not proud of it, but I believe the FDA needs to crack down on the drug abuse because that is the true teen killer. I started when I was in middle school, and several people I know also started at that time. The vaping epidemic isn't the true epidemic that's harming youth and the adults of America. Stomp and Peak, I absolutely agree with you. Thank you so much for that information, and thank you so much for leaving a comment. So that is where we're going to leave this 510 report. Don't forget, join CASA. It's free, it's easy, all you need is an email and you can get up to the date information on possible vape legislation happening in your particular city, state, or area. Thank you everybody for joining me. And as Kevin Skipper always said, you don't have to do everything, but you do have to do something. 
Let's get involved.